uh, I'm Jordan Seidel. I'm one of the doctoral interns at the Counseling Center. Um, so before we begin, just make sure if you have a question for me uh, specifically, put it in the Q&A. And if you have just a general question um, about the Counseling Center, you can put that into the chat. So at the end of the presentation, I'll go through whatever you know is in the Q&A and then we can talk about that then. So um, I'll just begin. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, you know, coping through uh, episodes of panic. Our objectives are going to be, you know, um, we're going to try to recognize what is happening when we're experiencing panic. And we're going to uh, learn specific strategies to help us regulate our nervous system during those moments of panic. Uh, and this will include uh, a guided mindfulness meditation at the end of the presentation. So I encourage you to participate if you can. If you don't wanna participate in the mindfulness uh, meditation, then you certainly don't have to. You can you know, sit quiet, quietly, comfortably um, and wait until we're finished. And some of the meditation is gonna focus on the breath. And I do understand that for some people, um, focusing on the breath can actually be uh, panic inducing or anxiety inducing. So, you know, do whatever you feel is, is comfortable. All right. So panic attacks or episodes of panic, however you kind of want to talk about them. I'm, I'm not going to go into the DSM diagnoses because I think um, well, for one, at the Counseling Center, we don't um, diagnose, but also sometimes we can kind of get stuck um, in those like strict DSM terms. And, you know, the way that you're experiencing your symptomatology is the way that you're experiencing it. Um, and you can very well be experiencing panic um, and not have, you know, not meet the criteria, criteria for a DSM diagnosis, but it doesn't, you know, minimize your experience, right? So panic attacks or episodes of panic are something that no one can really prepare you for. Uh, the first time that you have one can be really terrifying, a really scary experience. Um, sometimes we may even end up in the ER uh, because we think we're having a heart attack. Uh, and this is nothing to be ashamed of. It's really common actually for that to happen. I have a good amount of clients who, who this has happened to. Um, I have a sister who works in the ER who's confirmed that this happens pretty frequently. Um, if this does happen, usually they're gonna do like an EKG, they're gonna do, a, that's an electrocardiogram. Um, it measures the heart rhythm of your heart and they might do like a chest X-ray. Um, and I don't say this to, to worry you or make you fearful um, that you'll end up in the ER if you do experience panic. But I say to normalize it, to normalize the experience, um, because it is something that that does happen sometimes, and I don't want there to be any shame associated with that. Um, because what's happening during a panic attack is your heart is pounding. It can be really difficult to catch your breath, especially if you're starting to hyperventilate. Um, it just consumes you with fear, and you may even think that you're dying, and and that you know um, is really so fortunately, though, a panic attack will always end, right? It's, even though sometimes it feels like it's never going to end or it's going to last forever, um, it does only last between 10 to 30 minutes. And it doesn't last very long because your body eventually needs to move itself back into homeostasis. And we'll uh, talk about coping through panic later on, but something um, that you can do when you're experiencing panic is that you can remind yourself that this will pass, right? And you know, you know, the adage, this too, this too shall pass. Um, I know it sounds trite, but it really will. Sometimes, you know, repeating that to yourself can be helpful uh, in those moments. Okay, so I wanna provide y'all with some psychoeducation about what is actually happening in your body during a panic attack. And I apologize in advance, I'm gonna sound a little bit professory in this moment, um, but alas. So you're probably familiar with what we call the fight or flight response. And when your body goes into fight or flight, your body is engaging the autonomic nervous system. And I indicated that with the red arrow. So a way to remember 
what this part of your nervous system is called is it sounds like automatic so the autonomic nervous system does things for us that are you know automatic like controlling our breathing controlling our heart rate controlling our digestion um and the autonomic nervous system is made up of two branches and that's the sympathetic and that's indicated by orange and then the parasympathetic which is indicated by blue so when your body responds to danger it's specifically engaging the sympathetic nervous system so this is acting like a gas pedal if you will so it activates a sudden release of hormones um and it's in the, uh, the hormones come from the adrenal glands. So those are what's the, atop your kidneys. Um, and so the, the hormone that's usually released is adrenaline. Um, so what happens during a panic attack is that adrenaline rushes through your body and it gears you up for a fight that doesn't exist. Um, it's like if you've seen a bear, but there is no bear. Um, or I some another way I describe it to some of my clients is if you, you know that feeling of when you lean back in your chair and you think you're about to fall backwards? Um, it's that feeling, but lodged in your chest and you haven't done anything to elicit that feeling. So during a panic attack, your adrenal adrenaline levels um, actually can spike um, by two and a half times. So that's a lot of adrenaline pumping through your body. So um, with that said, your body isn't meant to be constant constantly on alert like this, right? You're not supposed to be in a consistent fight or flight mode. And this can happen with chronic panic and it can have negative and, and serious effects on your body, um, which is why um, talking about the coping skills later is really important because what happens with the coping skills is that we're engaging the parasympathetic nervous system. So that other piece. Um, and that's going to act like the brake pedal. So the sympathetic nervous system is acting like the gas pedal and the parasympathetic is acting like the brake pedal. So what we're trying to do is engage that parasympathetic nervous system. Some psychologists call it um, like engaging para. So they call it para, P-A-R-A. -A. Um, so, you know, the fight or flight response is tricky, right? Tense having tense muscles may prepare you to get away from danger quickly, but muscles that are constantly tense can result in pain, tension, headaches, migraines, et cetera. Um, and, you know, adrenaline and cortisol, that's another stress hormone. Um, they're responsible for the increased heartbeat and breathing, which again can help when we're facing a threat, but they also, you know, affect our digestion, affect our blood sugar, affect our gut health. And our gut health very much is connected to our mental health. And there's a lot of, you know, empirical evidence that suggests that. You know, a sudden strong increase and anxiety, fear, and panic, obviously. And we may be able to identify the trigger for the panic attack, but they also can occur when there's no identifiable trigger. Um, and this is what can be so frustrating about panic, you know, the, the moments where it feels like it comes out of, you know, nowhere, or it comes out of the blue, um, like the rug is being ripped out from under us almost, but the rug is our like feeling of homeostasis within our bodies. Um, and this slide just has some symptoms of um, panic attacks like heart palpitations, pounding heart, um, you know, sweating, trembling, feeling like you're choking, nausea, dizziness. Um, we'll talk a little bit about derealization and depersonalization, um, numbness, feeling like you're dying. Just really, really intense um, symptoms. And generally, there's no single known cause of panic attacks. Um, there are several factors believed to be important in the development of panic attacks. So, uh, and of course, this varies from person to person. Um, there's no thing, as far as genetic factors are concerned, there's no single gene that's been identified to cause panic attacks. Um, studies have shown that if you have a first degree relative, so like a parent, um, for example, who experiences them, it might make you more likely to experience them at some point in your life as well. Um, and then as far as like psychological factors, um, this can include chronic stress, right? Um, you could be taught at a young age that 
internal internal physical sensations are to be worried about, right? Like say you grow up with someone who might be, um, for lack of a better term, like a little bit of like a hypochondriac, like that can definitely affect how we pay attention to our body. Um, you know, comorbid um, mental health difficulties such as depression, OCD, P PTSD, phobias, you know, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, all these things, you know, could also play a role. Um, you yourself having a strong internal focus, you know, are you really hypervigilant to changes in your body? Um, that can definitely play a role too. And it, it is kind of a chicken or the egg phenomenon, right? Like, is the panic attack making you be a person who is more hypervigilant or were you hypervigilant before you started experiencing panic? Um, and then some environmental factors like you could you know, be experiencing a recent um, death or bereavement, uh, mourning, grieving, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe there's a stressful life event happening. Uh, maybe you just experienced a breakdown of a relationship. So a lot of factors can be at play here. To the next slide. Okay. So, what's the difference between a panic attack and an anxiety attack? We'll use these terms um, interchangeably. They are, are accompanied by, you know, the symptoms we talked about um, earlier. In contrast, anxiety or anxiety attacks. Uh, generally intensify over a, a longer period of time um, and is usually correlated with excessive worry. Um, you know, it could be perceived um, uh, something coming up that is perceived as being really stressful. So it's anticipatory, right? So it's a, a building up of stress, um, a building up of feeling overwhelmed. And that, that feeling of being overwhelmed, that's what feels like an attack. Right. So the difference really is the intensity and the suddenness that's the panic attack. And then the more gradual and then like the feeling of just being completely overwhelmed, that's more of the anxiety attack. Uh, but it's important to note that you can experience both, both anxiety and panic. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, but I just wanted to kind of point out that there are differences and sometimes we um, we'll, you know, say we had an anxiety attack when we really mean that we had a panic attack. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so in the symptoms, um, it mentions the derealization and the depersonalization, and I just wanted to um, go into this just a little bit um, in case you all haven't heard of these before. So during episodes of panic, you may experience these things. So derealization, it's a mental state where you feel detached from your surroundings. Um, people and objects around you may seem unreal. You're aware that this is, that this altered state isn't normal. Um, and your surroundings appear distorted, blurry, colorless, two-dimensional, maybe artificial. Um, and you have a heightened awareness and clarity of your surroundings too. So there is a duality within this that can, can just be overall confusing in its own right. Um, and there may be distortions in perception of time, um, such as recent, recent events feeling like a distant past. Um, so that's the derealization. And then depersonalization is a state in which um, an individual feels that either himself or the outside world is unreal. So you may experience feelings of being alienated from or unfamiliar with your surroundings. For example, maybe you feel like you're living in a movie or living in a dream. Uh, you may be feeling emotionally disconnected from people. Um, and it's as if you're you know, separated by a glass wall. So y'all might have heard of dissociation. These two things are a bit different, but um, they can be really, uh, disorienting and dysregulating and just, you know, hard experiences to have. So I wanted to also speak to them as well and normalize them if you are experiencing that. Okay. Okay. So there's a cycle that we can fall into when we experience panic. 
um, after experiencing one or several panic attacks, the fear of having future panic attacks can develop. Uh, as a result, people may avoid situations altogether with, where they fear they are likely to experience another panic attack, um, or they may go into you know, feared situations and subsequently just take precautions. So for example, if someone has to go into a group setting or a crowd, um, an individual who fears that they might have a panic attack may position themselves near an exit so that they can escape quickly um, should another panic attack happen. Um, another example is, I know that no one's really going to movie theaters right now or concerts or plays, but if you, if you do find yourself in the future um, at a movie theater or concert or play and you experience panic, um, and, and this avoidance behavior, you might you know, sit in an aisle seat towards the back, for example, so that you have an easier escape. And we call this um, agoraphobia. And oftentimes agoraphobia gets misconstrued as like fear of um, leaving the house. And that's not what it is. So agoraphobia and within the DSM, and I'll bring up the DSM just this one time, the panic disorder either is panic disorder with agoraphobia or panic disorder without agoraphobia. So within this um, example, what's happening is there, this agoraphobic response. So it's a fear of having another panic attack where escape might be um, difficult or impossible. For example, if you're on a plane, right? Um, but if you feel like you could feel yourself, you know, feel panicky in a car, especially if you're not the person driving, um, because there's a lack of control there, right? Um, public transportation um, can be anxiety provoking, trains, buses, etc. Standing in line even can be anxiety provoking. Um, some people don't like going over bridges. So anything where escape feels like it could be tricky or difficult or impossible. Um, and just generally, you know, following an experience of panic um, or experiences of panic, a person ends up losing, you know, confidence in situations where they previously didn't have problems with confidence. So, you know, there is like um, a, almost like a mourning process of, of you, uh, you once could go, you know, to let's just use the movies again as an example and be fine and sit in the middle and like not worry about, you know, um, if you're going to have a panic attack or not and have to like get up and walk in front of people. Um, and so there's, it, there's a difficulty in that. And it really, it's for lack of a better word, it, it really sucks because it truly, it ends up altering your sense of self and kind of how you experience yourself within the world. Okay, so now we're at coping tools, which is kind of the main reason we're here. So um, there's a couple things that I like to talk about. Um, tip skills are my favorite, but um, I will first talk about diaphragmatic breathing. So, and, we're, and we'll go into these in more detail. This is just kind of the slide to outline what we're gonna talk about. Um, so diaphragmatic breathing is important. Grounding techniques are important. And then tip skills are important. Um, if you are doing individual therapy work already, you might be cognizant of these things. If you're not, um, and you haven't heard of these things, cool. And if you have heard of these things, it's always just good you know, to get a refresher and, um, I mean, it's good even for me to get a refresher sometimes with this stuff. So um, we'll start with um, the TIP skills. So TIP stands for temperature, intense exercise, paired muscle relaxation, and paced breathing. Um, so this, so this is the T. So temperature. Um, so my favorite part of TIP skills is temperature. Quite honestly, because it's effective. And I like the idea of tricking your body. So the goal here is to elicit what we refer to as the dive response. So what you do, and, I, and it sounds a little intense, but it works. So you fill up a bowl of ice water and you hold your breath and you put your face in it. Um, so what you're doing is you're tricking your body into thinking that you have um, dove into cold water. So, and it takes about 15 to 30 seconds to work. 
But what happens is your heart slows down, the blood flow to non-essential organs is reduced, blood flow is redirected to the brain and the heart. So this, what this does is it's bringing you to homeostasis, right? So when you're feeling dysregulated, when you're starting to notice that you're getting panicky, or maybe you're fully in that panic attack, this can be really, really, really effective. Um, and the effect stems from the signal sent by the nerves of your face. So when the nerves detect water all over the face, they send um, messages to what's called your vagus nerve. And that connects uh, the brain to the body, uh, among other things. And it regulates heart function. So in other words, what it's interfacing with, again, is the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So again, here we are engaging para. And we're doing it in a way that I think is pretty cool. And a lot of my clients utilize this technique and they find it really, really helpful. So I know it, does, I know it can sound a little intense to put your face into ice water and hold your breath. Um, but, you know, sometimes when you're in those moments of panic, you kind of just got to do what you got to do to get yourself back to homeostasis. Okay. Okay. And then, so the next thing I want to talk about is diaphragmatic breathing. So I just thought uh, the other day that made fun of Sarah because it said that we uh, teach people how to breathe, which I mean, it's wrong to be on it. Um, and the truth of the matter is that the majority of the population does breathe wrong. So uh, diaphragmatic Eli, it said the recording stuff. I don't know if that matters to you. Okay, cool. So that's diaphragmatic breathing. So moving to grounding techniques. Uh, this is another you know favorite of therapists. So you might have heard it before, but Grounding techniques can be really anxiety or panic. You may already be familiar with the 54321 technique, distract you from what's going on in your body. Um, and you can look at the image there. Um, but there's also more cognitive grounding techniques. So, for example, you can count back from 100 by 7 or maybe by 500 if you feel like you need more of a challenge. Um, you can also, you know, choose a category and a letter of the alphabet. For example, if I'm feeling like I need to distract my brain, um, I can choose a category like animals and then a letter of the alphabet. So let's say the A. Okay, I'm going to go through the Rolodex of my brain and list of my aunt. Brazilo, alligator, antelope, whatever. So I keep doing that. And that's all I'm focusing on, right? Like I'm not thinking about anything else. The only thing that I'm thinking about is as many animals that I can think of that start with the letter A. And what that's doing, what that is doing is, is it's basically bringing you to the present and bringing, it's distracting you um, and having you focus on this one thing so that the other stuff that's going on um, starts to minimize, right? Okay. And all these things, it's, you know, takes practice, right? So um, there, these things are not, you know, going to be like magic cures it, once you do them. You know, you got to keep kind of doing them. You're, you have to get used to them. Um, so if you feel frustrated, you know, maybe at one grounding technique doesn't work, like say the grounding in five senses doesn't work, like try a cognitive one or vice versa. Um, it really is. I tell a lot of my clients that some of this stuff really is, you know, throwing, throwing it at the wall to see what sticks. So um, anyway, so then the next one is paired muscle relaxation. So this is when you lie down and you, um, take turns with your muscle group tensing them. So let's say you start at your head and then you move down. So you'll tense, you know, the muscles in your face for five seconds and then you'll relax them. You'll tense your shoulders for five seconds and then you'll relax them and so on. So you move down your body until you get to your feet. 
And you can do that as many times as you want, you know, tensing and then relaxing. Um, and what it's doing is it's reminding your body what it's like to not feel tense, right? And it also is another good distraction method. Um, so that's paired muscle relaxation. And if anybody has any questions about these things, um, please don't hesitate to put them in the q and I'm not looking at the Q&A in this moment. I don't know if there's anything in it, but you know, um, at the end, we can definitely talk more about this stuff if you have further questions, because I am going over it a little bit briefly. Um, okay, so then the next is paced breathing. So again, you might be familiar with these things, but so um, we call this square breathing and it can be really helpful in regulating your breath. So you use the imagery of the square to keep the breath balanced. So breathing in for four seconds, holding for four seconds. And the hold is important because it allows the CO2 or the carbon di dioxide um, to enter your blood. So you know the trope of like someone hyperventilating into a paper bag. Um, that's essentially what the hold is doing. So it's helping that CO2 um, enter, your, enter your blood and, and calm you down by helping to synchronize your heartbeat and your breathing. Um, so again, the square breathing really is to just get your breathing balanced um, and, and imagining that square is helpful in that way. Okay. All right. And then mindfulness. So a way we can engage para or engage the parasympathetic nervous system, that brake pedal, right? is through mindfulness meditation and especially working with the breath. And this isn't something that you do while you're having a panic attack. So I wanna emphasize that. If you are having a panic attack, mindfulness meditation is not your go-to, right? You wanna try the other things we talked about because those are for more like acute anxiety and acute panic. So mindfulness really for me the way I conceptualize it is like it's more of a preventative measure right so like um for example like I get migraines so I take medicine that I will take if I have a migraine but then there's also preventative medicine right so that's kind of what this is the grounding techniques the tip skills those are what you do when you're having um panic and then mindfulness meditation is what you do and um, I, and I would honestly, like for my clients, I really try to get them to implement this um, as often as they can, maybe five minutes a day, if they can do that, like before bed or upon waking up. But, um, but again, it's more of a preventative measure. So it's, it's gonna be impossible to meditate while you're having a panic attack. So I just wanna emphasize that. Um, so anyway, Mindfulness is all about noticing and being curious and accepting of your experience. So this can be really difficult because um, we like we're trying to like when we're feeling like everything is out of our control, out of our control, it's it's hard to do anything, right? But what we can control is what we pay attention to. So we can turn off our alerts you know, like, obviously not all the time, it's good to be informed, but we can, in these moments, turn off our alerts, you know, keep the news, social media from stealing our awareness. We can, you know, drop our ruminations, our negative fantasies by attending to what's actually happening in our inner world, right, right now here in the present, and that's through mindfulness meditation. And attending to what is happening within us at any given moment, keeps, you know, a crappy external reality from determining our inner truth. So it really allows us to cultivate calm and allows us to cultivate an open-mindedness and it allows us to cultivate a non-reactivity, right? Because what happens with panic and what happens with anxiety is it's us being reactive. It's our body reacting. Um, so what mindfulness does is is training your mind is training your body to be non-reactive um so anyway i think that you know mindfulness 
is special in that it's something that we naturally possess, right? And it's more readily available when we practice it on a daily basis. So I, I try to practice what I preach. It definitely is difficult. Mindfulness is tough. Um, you really got to stick, stick with it. That's why I say, you know, start small, start five minutes you know, every day or every other day, or maybe once a week, you know, whatever fits your schedule, whatever feels doable for you. Um, but it really, really is helpful. And they have tons of empirical evidence for this. So um, if you're up for it, I would love to lead a guided mindfulness meditation. Um, so I encourage those who want to participate in this to um, find a comfortable position. And if you don't want to participate in this, that's totally fine too. Um, you know, if you just want to sit quietly, that's, that's definitely fine as well. Um, but yeah, just find a comfortable position. I'll give you, you know, a minute or so to do that. All right, so I'm, I'm going to begin. So if it feels right, close your eyes. Take a deep breath. And as you exhale, relax your body. Take another deep breath. And as you exhale, relax your body deeper and deeper. Take another deep breath, and as you exhale, imagine relaxing your body as completely as you can. Take another deep breath, and as you exhale, relax your mind. Let your thoughts float away. Let your mind come into stillness and quiet. Focus in on your breathing. Notice how the air enters and exits your body, feeling your stomach rise on every inhale and fall on every exhale. All that matters in this moment is your breath and the words you are hearing. Anytime your mind wanders, that's okay. Just return your awareness back to your breath. And as you breathe softly and slowly, you feel yourself letting go, entering into a state of deep peace and relaxation. And as you're breathing, continues to soften and deepen, you begin to sense the glow of a soft blue light. It's beginning to float down over the top of your head, flowing over your face, bringing deep relaxation as the soft blue light continues to flow down your neck into your shoulders and down your arms. Everywhere the soft blue light touches, you experience 
relaxation. The soft blue light continues down your chest, down your back, and down your torso. Feel yourself sinking into this wave of peace and relaxation as the blue light continues down through your hips and your thighs, down through your knees, your calves, and all the way down into the soles of your feet. Your entire being is illuminated in soft blue light and you feel every cell within you relaxing and letting go. Take this peaceful feeling with you. Become aware of your body in the room. Slowly begin to wiggle your fingers and toes. And when you feel ready, open your eyes and come back into the room. I'll just give everybody a minute or so to take it back. Okay, so um and I'd be happy to hear, you know, anybody's experience with that. You know, maybe you liked it, maybe you hated it. Um, if you want to put anything in the in the Q and A, I'm more than happy to talk more. Um, so this slide is just, you know, knowing your resources, what's available for you, um, as far as um, the counseling center. So we have some mental health services available right now. We have groups. Um, the one group that we do have open still is actually a mindfulness group. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, that is still open. Um, if you ever feel like you're in crisis, we do have crisis appointments at the counseling center. Um, they're within business hours. So if you ever feel like you're in crisis outside of our business hours, that's the number to call, the one eight seven seven four six six zero six six zero. That is the Hayes County crisis uh, number. So as long as you're in Hayes County. Um, okay. And then you can also check out the Counseling Center's um, website. And then there's also TAU. So um, again, this is on the Counseling Center's website. Basically, it's a it's really good um, self-help stuff. So if you feel like you want any extra support as far as, you know, uh, um, you know, stress, anxiety, depression, um, like symptomatology that is pretty um, common when it comes to those those things. Uh, Tau can be really helpful. Um, you know, there's exercises, there's videos, etc. So um, again, that link is accessible on the Counseling Center website. So, all right. And then this is just the um, feedback survey. So there's a QR code. Um, and I think Eli will put in the chat the link. Um, so let me see. It looks like there's two people. With two. Um, okay. So I like meditating a lot, but I struggle with keeping my eyes closed for that long since they judge a lot. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I mean, sometimes people will like to um, do meditation and focus on something in the room. So if you find that you have anything in the room that you can um, look at, you don't have to close your eyes, that might be helpful. Um, that's just kind of the first thing that comes to my mind. 
So yeah, some people, you know, don't necessarily prefer to close their eyes. Um, so instead they'll, you know, stare maybe at the ground or um, again, if something in the room is like helpful to look at, they'll also look um, at that. And you kind of, you let your, um, the best of your ability, you kind of let your eyes unfocus. Um, so I hope that's helpful. And, and then I enjoyed the meditation. The soft blue light focus was important because when my mind wandered, I came back to the vision of light. Yeah, and that's a really important um, point. So um, what is cool about guided mindfulness meditation is that the guidance can kind of help bring us back. And like, especially, you know, when it comes to something that can be more like visual in our mind's eye, that can be really helpful. So there are some people who can meditate, you know, just in silence, which uh, to me, that's impressive. I can't do it. I need, I need guided meditation. Um, I utilize the Calm app. So um, everyone has a different um, app that they like. Some people like Headspace. Some people like Calm. I, I, I tend to like Calm. Um, you, you can, you know, go to YouTube, type in, you know, five minute mindfulness meditation for whatever, if there's tons of them. So, um, but yeah, it can be really helpful um, to have that type of guidance. I find that helpful too, because my, my mind will wander too. And, and what's important to remember about mindfulness meditation is that one, we're doing it non-judgmentally, right? So if we're noticing that our mind is wandering, we're just going to be curious about that, right? And we're going to try to acknowledge the thought that we're having, and then we're going to try to just let it float away. And it's easier said than done. But again, with practice, it can be, um, you know, practice makes perfect as cliche as it sounds. And like I said, I try to practice what I preach. I'm still, I still struggle with mindfulness. You know, it's, it's difficult. It's hard to be in the present. It's hard to um, detach from from things, right? We all are like constantly stimulated by um, our electronics, by Zoom, right? Like we're learning in a completely different capacity where many faces are staring at us um, every day. And that's, you know, not normal. So it's, it's even harder to disconnect, I would argue now. So um, does anyone have any other things that they want to put in the Q&A? Make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, I think I did that right, Eli. I'm not sure. Um, okay. And then, all right. So um, on campus, if you uh, go to the Student Health Center and you um, do a mental health evaluation appointment um, and just kind of tell them what's going on um, and they feel like you need medication, then that's you know when they can possibly give you a diagnosis. Um, but yeah, the counseling center doesn't formally diagnose. Um, but if you are looking, you know, for a mental health evaluation, the student health center does do that um, with the general practitioners who are there. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Well, just um, if I'll just uh, it doesn't seem like anyone else has any um Q and A stuff, and I guess I'll just put it out there. Does anyone have any questions about you know any of the um specific coping skills or anything like that, or even you know the biology of what's happening during you know episodes of panic? or a slide that you want me to go back to. I don't want to leave anything on the table for anybody. So 
So, okay, someone asked if lip biting um, is a symptom or slash chewing is a symptom of panic. Um, it can be a symptom of anxiety for sure. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's hard to, to say. I, a lot of times like things can be like intertwined with other stuff, but um, has it come up with other clients that I've had who um, experience anxiety, symptomatology and lip biting? Yeah, for sure. I don't know if it's directly related to panic specifically, but of course we know that anxiety and panic, you know, walk hand in hand oftentimes. So it, yeah, it very well could be um, a symptom of, of anxiety. And then that anxiety also, you know, compounds on onto panic symptomatology for sure. Good question. Mm -hmm. So someone wants me to go back to the derealization, depersonalization slide. So there's that. Does anyone have any um, like thoughts about that or? So someone asked why is dissociating a term that's popular right now? I've been seeing it a lot. So dissociating, I, I maybe it's like in the vernacular now with I don't know Gen Z in general because I I do feel like Gen Z is um, more conscious and of their mental health in a way that I think is really productive. So I think and like the stigma is is lessened as far as like seeking mental health treatment etc so I think like dissociation has always been around but I think what's happening is people are more willing to talk about it and also it's it's a trauma response oftentimes and and honestly like what is going on just generally in the in the population right now with COVID with you know everything else that's been terrible um, we're experiencing a collective trauma. So dissociating, you know, across the board right now for our population is pretty common. Um, and it can look a lot of different ways, but I think that it's popping up right now and in our vernacular because we are experiencing collective trauma in a really profound way. So, um, and how long can you be in a derealization state? Um, I feel like this thing. So that's a good question. It varies from person to person. Um, and when you're in a derealization state, it, the, I would say that the best um, coping skill to try to utilize is those grounding techniques because it can try to ground you in, in, in reality, ground you in, um, in like either a cognitive way or a bodily way, depending on what feels most dysregulated. Um, but I, it, it's hard to say, it really varies um, person to person. So I don't have a really concrete answer for that. Um, but if you are experiencing derealization, they do encourage you to really try um, to utilize those grounding techniques. Um, also one good one to do is um, if you have like a trinket, or something like that, like something that feels like it connects to you that you can hold, um, that can be really helpful too. So like a grounding object can be really helpful. Um, so the slide with all the coping, okay, yep. So I'll show the slide that has the coping strategies on it. Where did I put it? Oh, there it is. Okay, so there's that.
Anybody uh, need anything else or have anything else they want to ask? All right, so I'm just going to put this um, slide up again just in case you missed it. Um, that's just for y'all to, uh, you know, make sure that. If I missed anything, you know, I can add it next time. Or, you know, if you also want to sing my praises, that's totally fine as well. Um, but if nobody has, you know, anything else, um, it was, you know, a pleasure presenting on this. I think it's really, you know, prevalent and relevant to what we're experiencing right now. So I hope it was helpful. Um, I hope, you know, everybody has a good rest of their evening. It's lovely outside so um i hope maybe you can like go take a walk or or something so have a good rest of your evening y'all